Honourable Members, I draw to the attention the passing of the former member of Arafura, Mr Lawrence Costa. On behalf of Honourable Members, I extend a warm welcome to Ebony and family of Mr Costa in the chamber today. I remind our honourable members that in the completion of this debate, I will ask members to stand for a one minute silence as a mark of respect. I call the Chief Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I move that this assembly express its deep condolences to the family of the former member for Arafura, Mr Lawrence Costa, and I acknowledge his family, his friends and former colleagues who are here with us today and, of course, his parliamentary colleagues. I would like to, before I deliver this motion of condolence, acknowledge the Larrakia people and thank them for their custodianship. And I acknowledge the Tiwi people who have a close relationship with the Larrakia and that this is a difficult day for the people of the Tiwi Islands. Everyone who knew Lawrence knew that he was an excellent local member and an all-round great man. He had time for everyone, no matter what time of the day or night it was. He felt a responsibility to be available to everyone who needed him, and he was. His community was so important to him. A proud Tiwi man from Manapui, whose homeland at Pichmanjara, on the top of the north coast of Nelville Island. Lawrence attended school in the mid-80s on the Tiwi Islands, but then he travelled to Melbourne and completed his senior years as a boarder at St Bede's College. In reflecting on Lawrence's journey, I took some time to revisit his maiden speech in this house. In this speech, he shared his life, his education, family, and those people who inspired him to be a leader and to enter the Northern Territory Parliament for his people. Lawrence finished school in 1988 and went on to study at the Melbourne University. It was at Melbourne University where he met his beautiful wife, Ebony. Lawrence deferred his studies and he and Ebony moved back to the Territory to be with family. It wasn't long after that that they welcomed their beautiful daughter, Janita, who is here today with the beautiful grandchildren. They stayed in Darwin for two years before again moving, this time to Tweed Heads to be close to Ebony's family. We all know that Lawrence's life was centred around his family, so moving closer to Ebony's family for Janita to get to know them too was important. Lawrence was a determined man. He worked as a student support officer with New South Wales TAFE whilst he always stud while he studied for three and a half years. It was this persistence that saw him gain skills and experience which provided him the opportunity to return to the Territory in 1996 as the CDEP coordinator in Pearl and Gympie. He went on to hold various jobs in local government, ATSIC and the health sector. He was the CEO of the Tiwi Islands Local Government and the Director of Community Development and Engagement for the Tiwi Islands Shire Council. He also served as the Deputy Chair of the Jabiru Regional Council and then went on to become the Chairperson of the Northwest Regional Council. He gained a wide range of experience in his elected positions on various local government and other community control boards and this really saw his community spirit grow. His more recent employment before entering politics was in the health sector as a health services and development and engagement officer and alcohol and other drugs worker for Territory Health Services based on the Tiwi Islands. This is where mine and Lawrence's paths crossed. Because of his experience and passion for healthcare and the delivery of that in remote communities, Lawrence was appointed as the Assistant Minister for Remote Health where he supported me as the Health Minister. It was an absolute privilege to work with him and he showed me so much as a proud community man wanting services as close to home for his community members. He provided invaluable insights into health issues in a remote context and supported the development of strong networks to deliver quality care. Together we would travel to remote primary centres, care centres where he demonstrated his deep understanding of the communities, their values and priorities, and we always crossed paths with old colleagues of his. Whenever we enter the community, you could tell that Lawrence was a respected leader and he gave the same respect back in return. He made time for everyone that wanted to speak with him, which is how he represented the views of his community so well, and with compassion and dignity. Lawrence was an advocate for culturally appropriate education programs. He had a strong desire to see Indigenous people gain skills and training so they can go back to their communities where they want to be, 
while also providing culturally appropriate services to their people. He was passionate, Mr Speaker, about reducing the harms of alcohol and other drugs in communities and developed innovative programs especially meaningful for young people to engage with them. He was eager to learn and continued to develop his skills in the alcohol and other drug sector so that he could share his knowledge with community leaders and stakeholders for a coordinated response. Lawrence always spoke so highly of his father, a father that taught him his culture, his responsibilities and provided him with the opportunity to travel down south for new opportunities to broaden his horizons and for a quality education. We know that his father, a respected Tiwi man himself, was immensely proud of his son, a family man, a respected leader in his community. We only, Mr Speaker, months before Lawrence's passing, had all been together supporting him when his father had passed away. But we know, Mr Speaker, that those best mates are now together again. Lawrence said, and I quote from Hansard, I will be forever grateful to my father for sending me down south to get an education. It taught me who I was from a young Aboriginal man experiencing racism for the first time, but it taught me to be respectful towards other ethnic groups, many of whom were represented amongst the students enrolled at my school. I also learnt about discipline and perseverance. Lawrence worked hard for the people in the Arafura electorate. He worked hard for Aboriginal Territorians and for all Territorians, Mr Speaker. He worked hard so that bush people could have their land and their rights. He continued the great work of the members before him, Uncle Morris, who mentored Lawrence when he was at boarding school, Stan Tipalura and Marion Scrimshaw. Lawrence was no different. He worked for his people. He left a legacy for others to follow. Lawrence wasn't in politics for himself. He never really wanted to go for a ministerial position because he knew it would take him away from his people. And he wanted more than anything to help his constituents. He went into politics, Mr Speaker, to be the local member, to be the strong voice for the people of the Tiwi Islands and West Arnhem Land, and by extension, for First Nations people everywhere. Everyone knew Lawrence was an excellent local member, maybe too good. He didn't fob people off, telling them to leave a message at his electorate office or pass them on to advisers or staff. He gave out his phone number to everyone, and that meant he would get calls 24 hours a day all sorts of requests that it got to the point when he was advised perhaps he could have one phone for family and another for work. But he wouldn't do that, much, I think, to the annoyance of his family. But they could see his passion for his people. He had a responsibility to be available to everyone who needed him. In his maiden speech, Mr Speaker, he reflected upon the people who had held the seat of Arafura. It meant so much for him that he held that seat he idolised Morris Rioli and, as I mentioned, was strongly supported by Marion Scrimshaw and I know she passes her regards on today as this parliament passes this condolence motion. And she would be extremely proud of you, the new member for Arafura. Lawrence took that sense of service he had across his electorate and, I believe, across Australia. As a politician, he was always a community member. He listened, he spoke, and when he spoke, we listened on this side of the House. And that accounts for how he was able to achieve so much for the people of Arafura. He was especially proud, Mr Speaker, of bringing better housing to his people. He argued passionately for it. He once said, we cannot expect people to hold down a job or go to school on a regular basis if they do not have proper housing facilities. And he said housing was the issue that was most consistently raised with him. He felt fortunate to be able to walk in both the Tiwi and Western worlds and to us, it appeared he did this with ease, but I'm sure at times it was difficult. It also allowed him to see very clearly where Aboriginal people were being let down by services, and he was a relentless advocate who pushed hard for every community. He oversaw the construction of upgrade of around 700 homes across Arafura. He transformed the social landscape and improved the lives of thousands of people. And he would get quite emotional if you were with him in a remote community and we saw new housing because he knew that that was a safe, secure home for people that would then provide them the opportunity to get an education, to have a job, and because he knew many did it so tough. He was always raising the issues, pushing and fighting. He would never give up on anything. And in this house, I believe he was a strong advocate, not just for First Nations people, but all Territorians. 
My colleagues and I have so many personal stories and memories, and I do, although tinged with sadness, look forward to hearing from them today. And to the staff that had the privilege to work with him, and I quote Mr Peter Wellings, who is here today, I was always impressed with his total respect for people he recognised as his elders in the community. This especially applied to his deeply respectful relationship with the older aunties in his communities. He was so at ease with his constituents across the board, but he always found time to pay his respect to senior women in his communities, as well as follow up on their issues. Mr Speaker, Lawrence was more than a politician. The member for Arafura from 2016 to earlier this year, representing the Tiwi Islands and West Arnhem Land. He was a colleague, he was a leader, he was a friend. He was a family man and we know that his family deeply missed him. But it would not be a true condolence motion for Mr Lawrence Costa if I did not mention the Richmond Tigers and the Imalu Tigers. We share that Tiger connection and in fact my partner wore his Imalu Tigers shirt when we were fishing on Saturday and made mention of Lawrence. And it is that connection, Mr Speaker, that my family, that I will always hold dearly. Everything he's done for our community, but our Tigers. He loves the Tigers and he would love, I've tried to wear some Tigers collars today, and he would love the Tigers ties that the men are wearing. Although, sorry Lawrence, some of the women forgot this morning. <laughs> Mr Speaker, I know that Ebony will have found the last few months very difficult. She was the love of Lawrence's life. They were together since they were so young and he is now gone from us. Again, I wish to express my deepest condolences to Ebony, Janita and the beloved grandchildren. He would be so proud to see Ariana sitting there beautifully today here in the parliament, all grown up, and little Langdon getting bigger by the weeks. He was a private person, Mr Speaker, Family was his sanctuary. Family meant everything. Mr Speaker, I would like to, in closing, thank everyone for the condolences and the memories they will put on the Hansard today. And we can think of our former colleague, who is now, of all the places in the world, the islands where he most wanted to be. He often talked about Pichamira and the beautiful Melville Island, and that is where he is laid to rest. He has gone home Rest in peace to a wonderful colleague, a leader, a friend, a husband, a father. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Yeah. Uh, opposition Leader. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I too rise to speak to the motion of condolence for our former colleague, Lawrence Costa. And while, of course, we may have had very different beliefs in this chamber, we all come here because we believe in the future of the Territory and we all come here to put our best foot forward on behalf of the communities that we represent. And so we always shared that sense of service. And losing a member of the Assembly has an impact on all of us. And I know that the CLP members were very shocked and saddened at the news of his passing, particularly so young, at just the age of 52. He leaves behind his loving wife, Ebony and Ebony. I acknowledge you, of course, in the gallery today and your children, uh, eight grandchildren and countless other family and friends that are here to support you. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, Ebony, Lawrence's wife, described him as her soulmate, her inspiration and her best friend. And Ebony, we offer you our most sincerest and heartfelt condolences. We offer our condolences to all that were impacted by Lawrence, a fierce advocate for Aboriginal Territorians and the community. You could see how much Lawrence was admired and the impact he had by the hundreds that turned out to his state funeral that we attended earlier this year. Many, of course, were wearing yellow and black, signifying his love, his love for the Imalu and Richmond Tigers football teams. He was elected in 2016 to this parliament, but his community advocacy and service spanned many decades prior to that. Working at the Pearl and Gympie Community Government Council between 1996 and 2002, he then went on to be elected on the Jabiru Regional Council as the deputy chairman and of course the Northwest Regional Council until 2005. In 2008, he became the CEO of the Tiwi Lands government, uh, local government after the amalgamation of the Shires. He then went on to do the community development role with the Tiwi Islands Shire until 2013. 
And so I have no doubt that all of his experience across local government, but also through the health and other sectors, gave him that passion that he had for his community and, of course, his his ability to deliver those grassroots outcomes um, for people because he was always so closely connected to the community and, and the people um, on the ground. We thank Lawrence very much for his service to the Northern Territory um, and it it is a very it has been a very sad time right from the start of this year through to now, but we're very pleased to be able to um, pay our condolence in a very respectful way as a tribute in the parliament and uh, our thoughts and prayers are with you all during this very difficult time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Member Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I too rise to talk on this condolence motion. Um, before I carry on, I'd like to acknowledge the people that have come today that was close to Uncle Costa, um, Baden Patty, and my mother's Uda Daganui, um, Auntie Cindy and Uncle Gordon from the Blythe River area, and Auntie Ebony and Janita. I I got I got um, I got working with Uncle so we've known each other for a long time, but I've, he got me formally in 2018 um, as his um, electorate officer. And during that time, I, um, I acknowledged his, um, how, he, how he worked in both worlds. He, how he handled, and I couldn't, I was watching him in awe, you know, he'd, he'd be a, He'd be a politician when he needed to, and he'd, and he'd be a family member and a TV man when he needed to. But balancing that was the was the key. Um, I I call him uncle in the outside world, but he is Nyam Mordi. He's my nephew or son because he's a descendant from the mullet. Um, before I go on to talking about all his achievements, I want to talk about how cheeky he was as a as an MLA and poor old Matty Ellis, who's he's um, <laughs> got the brunt of that. He he took him to um, he took him on his first trip to Manangrita, and Uncle Gordon was in the passenger seat. And just before they got into the community, they 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 pulled up because. Um, um, Matty Ellis wanted to go to the toilet. Um, so he pulled up and they let him get out of the car and he wind his window down and let Matty walk in. He goes, Oi, wrong side. You know, that's wrong side of the road. That's woman area. You know, you've got to come back this way. And poor old Matty's there, all confused and didn't want to break any cultural protocols. But on the other side was the airport. See, and there's no... <laughs> There's no hidden, no, nowhere to hide. <laughs> um, Maddie didn't know he was, he was getting, um, yeah, getting tricked until he turned around and everyone was laughing in the car. Yeah, he's like, oh, like, you know, we've got, we've got a traditional man here. He's pulling your leg. <laughs> I, um, I drive around and I, and I go into my electorate and I look at all the achievements. Um, I look at the road between Paru and Three Ways, and I look at the houses, and I and I. It's hard because I all that achievement. I wish he could see, especially the road nearly finishing. You know, there was a big project on TV Islands. I see the fruition of that, and I tell people that I say, "Oi, you know, the 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 member before me. This is his work. You know, I'm just the beneficiary, but." I'll do my bit when, when it's my time. Because I'm still finishing his time. That's what I say, you know. Um, for us TV Aboriginal people, um, death isn't just a one-off thing. It's a continuation of the spiritual journey, as people would know. And um, we're, still, we're still on that journey. You know, it's called that book of money period. Where we change our names, where we, where um, the widow is the widow for a certain amount of time. Um, can't mention his name as well. Can't. Um, some areas of that country is blocked off, and that's coming up. 
we, we normally it takes a year for us two people, and then that play that thing is called a clearing of this clearing ceremony, and that's what we'll look forward to later on this year with Auntie, and that's when we let go. His his last few years were really hard because he left he lost so much of his best mates, you know the Rioli the Rioli family, you know Manny, Uncle Morris, Uncle Sibby. And then his best mate, his fish, Bubbles. It, it really hurt me and him. Um, and, and, you know, we, we were very worried for it, me and Patty and Auntie Eb. Um, but like I say, it's a journey. And we're going to go back to Tiwi. And we're going to finish it up with all the appropriate tribes and send him off on his, on his journey and finish up. So that's all I want to say. And thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Leader of Government Business. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and following on from the member for uh, Arafura, uh, in normal context, we would refer to him as Kumanjay at home, uh, a place where our brother had a strong connection to Central Australia and grew up uh, spending time there. My grandfather uh, is his godfather. And my auntie, Eileen Hooson, is his godmother. And he always knew that he had a big home and a big heart in Central Australia. And what a man, what a man, what a bloody good man he was. Our brother was a great man. A man of such passion, such energy, such conviction for his people, our people. There is not a day that ever went by in the life of our brother that he didn't work to make life better for our people. It doesn't matter where he was. That's what he did. I would get a call a couple of times a week and, Mr Speaker, can't actually say how he would introduce himself <laughs> on that call because it would be unparliamentary. And a few times I'd get a call and we'd be having a yarn and I could hear breathing. But my brother was talking and I could hear this breathing. <laughs> and we're still talking and I could still hear this breathing. And I said, brother, can you hear that? And he'd start laughing. And then next minute, Auntie Marion would start talking. <laughs> His mum would have a three-way phone call and not tell me, and then that's how we're just going to see if he was going to rubbish Auntie Mim. <laughs> I said, oh, I said, no shame, brother. Lucky I never did. Um, but that's who he was. So cheeky. Before there was a football game with the mighty Richmond Tigers, he would ring up me and Joel. And we'd all have a bet how we'd go and, and who was going to win and who was going to shout if, if the team won and we made the grand final. <laughs> and that's, that's, that's the energy of our brother. That is who he was. And you'd go to community. I remember going to community with him and he's not talking about BBD. I'm thinking, what is BBD? Who is BBD? Big, black and deadly. That's Lawrence. <laughs> Cruising around. Then you'd be in Manangrida and they'd be like, you might have seen BBD? I said, who's BBD? Big, black and deadly. Lawrence. Oh, there, that motor car. He's here. And what was spoken about earlier was we always used to tease our brother, 1-800-Lawrence, because even in the gallery, even in the lobby, even in cruising out bush, as soon as the telecommunication come up, Ring, ring, hey, brother, you got a fuel prize, you got a blanket, you got food for me. And he did not wither once. I tell you now, he was the poorest politician that ever lived <laughs> because he'd give everything away, everything. He would never, ever say no to anyone. Doesn't matter where you were, doesn't even matter if it wasn't even in his own electorate. He would help people because that's who he was and that's who he is. And when we talk about him, in our way, he's not gone. Our brother is not gone. He is simply above us. He is with the ancestors and the creator spirits looking down on us. 
like the mighty Richmond Tigers, he is roaring from the heavens down on us, making sure that we look after our family sitting over there and support them and love them and nurture them because the legacy of our brother will live on forever. It won't just live on through the beautiful family and the beautiful friends, but it will live on through all of the projects that our brother delivered. Because he was not just any man. He was a man who absolutely stood by three core values. Family was everything for our brother. Family was absolutely everything. Country. He didn't talk about country like it was a place. For our brother, country was connected. Country lived, country breathed, country talked. And our brother heard country. And he talked up for country, not just in here, whether it was on council, whether it was on ATSIC, whether it was on a board. He always talked about the importance of country and culture. Culture was everything for him. Now, a few stories like uh, my other brother, Manny, was talking about today. We, we went out. We was in Manningreda, I think we were kind of, I think we was Matty, with Matty Ryan. And he was teaching this mob how to do, you know, ceremony, showing them, you know, some white fellas how to do it. And he said, you got to get on the ground and you've got to start crawling now because that's the turtle. <laughs> These white fellas, they got on the ground, they're crawling <laughs> along, they're crawling along. We was laughing because we knew that that thing for turtle is not crawling around like that. And then what doing it, they got up real business clothes all full of dust and you reckon, no, nah, that's not a turtle. That's just looking silly. Then what, that's who he was. He was a real cheeky bloke. Everything he did though, he did with a smile. And when people used to get really hot, whether it was in here, whether it was out in the community, he'd just say to them, Come on, come out the back, have a cup of tea. Don't tell me your problems. Talk about it with the people. Overcome the challenges. We've got to do this respectfully. We've got to do it. I want to also acknowledge in this parliament um, this morning uh, that unfortunately uh, our auntie, my um, auntie Marion, couldn't be here today because she is at another funeral on, on Tiwi. Mm. It's been really hard for her. Mm. It's been really hard for Honey Marion. So hard that Honey Marion was the one who had to break the news to us. And I remember that call. And I remember how upset Honey Marion was. And how she was so devastated how hard this was going to be for the people of Arafura and for Ani Ebbs and the family. Because loving someone is easy. We, we do it every day. But missing him is the heartache that never goes away. We've kept the chair free in our government lobby, the chair that our brother used to sit in as a reminder of his presence is with us each and every day. There is a can of bully beef in our lobby that every black fella in our uh, caucus looks at and gets hungry to eat, but we won't <laughs> eat it because that's our brother's. It's actually a tin of bully beef that uh, myself and Minister Yearbo bought for our brother when we opened uh, the Tennant Creek IGA to say, hey, we bought you a gift from Tennant Creek. <laughs> and that's there as a reminder for our brother because you could have the flashes meals would go away and we'd have all these big flash dinners and our brother's like no no I'm right you're up. I'm going home to feed with, with Ebony what's your mob having now nah, we haven't bully beef stew <laughs> flash fun hey look out we even co uh, our brother even cooked some bully beef stew for people who had no idea what they were getting because he said I'm making you a bush delicacy tonight. <laughs> they ate that feed and they said, oh my God, this is beautiful. They nearly vomited when he showed them. It came out of a can. This is meat in a can. But that's who he was. 
so amazing. And just to see the joy on people's faces, but more importantly, the joy on our brother's face when he got to see exciting things like new families moving into their first home where his, his constituents, most of them his family, having their own bedroom for the first time. Country, his homeland and his outstation was always a place where we know that when things would get hard for him or when he was missing uncle, he'd go there and reconnect and regroup and regather and get the strength that he needed to continue. And, and that was incredibly, incredibly important. We know he was such a, a passionate Richmond Tiger supporter. So much so that we used to have arguments with Joel, who was the most committed, even though Joel was a former player. Of uh, but you know, these are these are important things that we we need to choose to celebrate today and remember. And you know, he would be so excited after coming back from a break of Parliament, where he'd been able to perform ceremony. That's what was important to him. Was this place? This place is important. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> it is important. We we make laws and we pass laws, but he never got caught up in this place being everything. He knew that everything was outside of this place. It was his people. It was his family. It was his country. It was his culture. And that's what I choose to remember, is that. Because that is who he is. And when we think about him, I, for it, don't, Mr Speaker, there's not a day that goes by when I'm in this place that I don't think about him. And as I said, I remember the comments that I'm not allowed to say on parliamentary record, (laughs) because we had a lot of cheeky banter. Um, particularly amongst the Black Caucus members uh, of our team. But they are important. And our family sitting up the back there, you are important. And we will always love you and care for you. And you'll always be a part of our lives. The phone may have stopped ringing, but the spirit and the energy is still with us. Mr Speaker. I want to thank everyone for coming, for making the journey to be here today. And we will be sad, and sadness will continue for a long time. And that's important to acknowledge that and work with it and live with it. But we need to remember as well and celebrate the life of our brother and use that to continue to do the good work to make sure that people living in Manangrida or over on the island or in Jabiru and all through uh, Arafura and all through the bush, that they get what our brother wanted them to get. That's access to services, that's supporting them to participate in language, law and culture. That's really important. Mr Speaker, I'm going to... um, leave it there, I think. But I also want to acknowledge a good friend um, of Lawrence Costas, Mm. our brother, who is no longer here in this parliament, um, and that was Scott McConnell. Because the three of us used to have some stories. And I'm, you know, I remember brother used to be going, bloody Scott, he's ringing me again. But we'd always have a good yarn. And uh, reflecting on this not too long ago when I was having coffee with Scotty and we were all laughing about the three of us and thinking, bloody hell, I don't know what Michael Gunner thought when the three of us walked into caucus (laughs) together because we were a a force to be reckoned with and we still are. But uh, I just want to acknowledge and pass my condolences on on behalf of Scotty who, um, of course, isn't here today to the family and just acknowledging on that. And certainly on behalf of everyone in Central Australia, um, 
acknowledging the presence that our brother still has in that beautiful part of the country. And, you know, he will always be remembered and we will always love him. Thank you. Thank you. Move for Moka, yeah, the call. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, first of all, I'd like to seek leave to speak in Yoma Mata. Is leave granted? Aye. Uh, leave is granted. Um, in areas that I want to speak in Yoma Mata, please. Thank you. Yo, Mara Ingia from Pimuanam Landmark. Yan Lakram Gamitian, he was my close member in chamber. He, he won't now support playing a deal in the chamber in the first time back in 2016. Um, yeah, I'm Yingya I come from North East Anaman of the electorate of Muka. And I, the first time I walked into the chamber here, and it still is, it's different to me. I'm still trying to get to get to know this. But the first sittings we had, he came over and supported me. Mm. And he would always say to me, Yo, Manma. And I would say, Yo, Manma. How are you? Good. And from then on, we grew up relationship to work together, and then we kind of reached around and tried to find our way around, around the chamber here, working with the Banda. And after, after on, we, I've always made, asked him like I do to Manuel Brown now, you got in a turtle for me. <laughs> <laughs> and I think you might, might have seen me in, 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 the, in at home there. I came over once and, and uh, maybe might have got some meat from uh, Lawrence. So that's how we close, we got really closely working together. And it's a pathway that we, he supported me and the walk and now he left me walking out there now with other other friends and even the, the people in the chamber, the, the government and the opposition. But I really thank him for being there for me in the first place to help me stand as I walked. The, like I said, first time I met met him was here in 2017, uh, 16 rather, on the first day of the sittings. I felt a connection with him as we had both come from our country places, and uh, he's the um, the electorate ends up towards, towards connects to my area, Maninguida, and the people of the Nawe Mala, somebody there, Una, Nakun Malara, other clan groups that, uh, three clans from me, Utis Anamlan, where Manin, uh, Manuel Bran lives now, and now I humbug him for turtle and fish. <laughs> yeah. And I found, found it. I am, like I said, I am a member of the, I am an, an independent member of the, and he was a labor, labor, but those things didn't matter because um, all, all that mattered was me and him standing together to so I could confront and walk with people. And even though I didn't meet them, there were, there were people like Morris Rowley and, and Stan and everybody else that I felt, oh, if they've been here, it must be like them as well. 
So, and we arrived in the parliament with the same, same purpose. We wanted to make things better for our people and come closer to the government, come closer to be a voice to represent our people. And now that um, with, even though he's parted now, left me, left us, uh, that, that uh, support he gave me at least, and maybe brother over there, I stand with that. And all I think I'll, uh, I'll stand here and walk because he supported me to work with people around here. And uh, I had wanted to make things better for our people. I found it easy to sit down and sit down with him and have yarn things always, always, and we started to say, okay, I'll come up your way, and uh, I'll come up your way sometime, and another time you come up my way. And we were from that, from halfway last term, we started to try and create, we go fishing and turtle hunting and have a, spend a bit of time in, in your area. And at the first trip I went to get closer to his home was uh, at his family's home in Malak. So uh, he was a leader who had the courage to keep going, to keep working for his people. And people found him a quite achiever like I was in the beginning when I got here. And uh, when he said, uh, you got to try and do things and support home and work with people here, you know, in a way that we, uh, with respect and uh, try and try and get a message through. And that were, that were his uh, support to me as well. And that's what I have come into. In my language, if you look in the handset, so you can see through my speeches, his support calling out, like I said, your main <laughs> and uh, say, how are you? Going well, very well. That um, interpretation. Uh, as I spoke in the Yurumamata, in in English, he would always support me. So, and uh, I had to come into Parliament. I had to come into Parliament environment that wasn't familiar. I could learn on him, and we could support one another always. But when he passed away, I really missed him. I felt a loss of a friend and an elder who stood this strange, <coughs> who understood this strange um, life moving between the chamber and back on country. He understood what needed to be done for our people and people like me as well. He had landed here, this chamber, in this chamber, to try and achieve a change and real outcomes for our people. We were planning to do, to go on the trip, like I said, uh, to Tiwi Islands, especially where he was staying and all the way through there. And that's why I wanted to be at his funeral in Tiwi. I could not stand 
and say goodbye without making making it his own country uh, with him, as I promised. So here in town, I saw all the countrymen at the first um, first memorial that was there in town, and for we in Darwin to attend the state funeral. And I could see he was a well-loved man, very loved man. Out on country, a lot of young people shared their sorrow and grief by dancing. And through by the sorrow and dancing we did, I saw a, a strong cultural movement and a and a family reunion at that funeral. And I, when I got my clapstick and I led some of our members here from the parliament and they felt it, I believe they felt it too. And it was a strong cultural connection. Even though lost one and, and passing away, but leaving a, a message behind that we want to try and trace, check up why was he here in this chamber, what was his purpose, and how did he leave such early, because he was really worried at loads of um, not pressure, but worry for his family, and we all want to work together towards a safer communities for people that, so that we can all um, live together and hopefully our voices from the communities, from the bush, can be heard clearly and his voices that he asked through question times and made comments, although very, very uh, rare, but a really quiet achiever just by being here uh, the government, government and the opposition understand what he was here for. Just by being around people and bringing people together. I can see this, that um, is who he was, a leader who brought change gently and calmly and almost didn't see, see it until you look back upon it. Now we can look back and see who he was. He was strong and thoughtful. My condolence goes to his family and friends back there. And I saw, I witnessed a strong culture, strong strong ceremonial culture, in, in a ceremonial culture that young people, and when I saw, I could, I could see that there were not only one clan, but different clans were around there, even from New York, they came over, participated, everyone. And they, nobody told me that, nobody explained to me what the song lines and dances were all about, but I could see it, and I could feel it. And uh, it was a strong, strong connection and a farewell with, with sorrow, but thankful for his departure. And fortunately, it was his time cut short. Who are here today? He has given us all the gifts of strong and thoughtful leadership, including me. The next generation must use the gift and continue his work. I know I will uh, walk his path and try and work with people, Manuel Brown, and, and reach out to other communities around the place 
and deeper into the chamber here, deeper into the chamber how we can convince the government, no matter who it is, might be the, the government now or the opposition when they become government, please expect us to, and respect us to, we are trying to call out for a freedom. We are calling out for a support so that we can have a, a safe way for our families and, a, and create a pathway for that our young generations or new generations will achieve something to, to, their, to the goal and the dream we want them to achieve. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then Mr. Anna, please, you have the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise on the condolence motion for Mr. Costa, the former member for Arapura and our beloved parliamentary and friend. Mr. Speaker, I first met Mr. Costa 2016 as a party candidate ahead of the 2016 NT election. We were both first elected in August 2016 to represent very large parts of the territory. Mr. Costa, obviously for Arapura, myself for Arnhem. Both of us as Bush members representing our electorates, which help communities and homelands, which very large portions of our own family connections in our respective seats. Mr. Costa and I shared a similar feeling of responsibility and obligation in our roles as elected members of parliament, in a sense that we felt a deeper burden of representing family in this job and making sure we always did our best. He understood that one day the job would end, but our responsibility and care for our families never does. Oh, I didn't want to be the first one to cry of a knee, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Costa held a deep sense of authority among our team and was a very valued member of our caucus. Mr. Costa, unlike most politicians, never talked just for the sake of talking. He was always careful and crafted in his contributions to make sure they would always add value and he would growl us if we were just doing the opposite. So this means that when he did make contributions during discussions, there was a certain type of respectful silence that fell on us. He we would all be poised, waiting for his wisdom and advice. Sometimes at key moments, Mr Costa would pause and we would all sit, waiting to hear what he was going to say. He would take a deep breath and, well, some very unparliamentary words would come out. I can't repeat them in the chamber, Mr. Speaker. Then all of us would erupt into laughter. Sometimes, and I hope I'm not breaking the, uh, the chamber um, rules in sharing this, we've talked about how cheeky he could be. He would take sneaky photos of us doing our speeches here in the chamber. Wow. For those of you who aren't aware, you're not supposed to take photos in the chamber without express permission from the speaker. So member for Goida, just sharing that little secret <laughs> as a former speaker, and uh, member for Karama as a former speaker, and, um, and member for Fong Lim as the current speaker. So you'd finish your speech. You'd sit down, it'd often be late at night after adjournment speech. There's not many people physically in the chamber. I know everyone's listening intently to adjournments. And then uh, 
I would get a little text on my phone and there I am standing up looking like I'm talking to a gallery of people with just by myself <laughs> and Costa would be taking the sneaky photo over there from his seat. I enjoyed reading his very insightful Facebook quotes. Always very deep and thoughtful. And geez, he loved those 3D photos. Yeah. I can't bring myself to do them on Facebook. I have tried, I have tried, and every time I have a look, I go, nah. But he loved those 3D photos on Facebook, that old man. One of my favourite memories was cruising around here and down one weekend, and we saw Mr Costa driving ahead of our car. I was in the car with my husband, Corey. We pulled up next to his car at the traffic lights, and I was in the passenger seat, so I wound down the window and sung out to him. We both had 200 series Land Cruisers. So we're sitting at the light and said, hey, where are you going? It was a Saturday, and despite it being a Saturday, he was off to a land council meeting to meet with his constituents. He had some freshly made fried damper, which his wife, Ebony, had made in the car, and asked if I wanted any. Well, Mr Speaker, I love fried damper, so I said, yes, of course. So he grabbed out a few of the fried dampers from the container that Ebony had probably diligently packed at home, ready for his land council meeting. And we're sitting there at the traffic lights and he's passing it over to me in the traffic light. The light goes green. I said to Corey, wait, I think there's one more fried damper. Grabbed it out and then off we went. And thanks, Eb, for the fried damper. <laughs> Mr Costa had an almost comical relationship with some of his long-term contacts. I recall a few times talking on the phone with him and there's bickering and growling and again maybe some unparliamentary words that can't be repeated in the chamber. And I said, who are you talking to? Who's there with you? And it'd be the NLC chairman, Samuel Bush <laughs> Blanazi, Dr Samuel Bush Blanazi. Good ways though, they were teasing each other and I just could not stop listening to, uh, laughing and listening to these older middle-aged men having a go at each other really cranky and if you'd just called in you would think they were having a big fight and then they'd laugh and they'd go on to another topic but they were always working together to get things done. Former Chief Minister Michael Gunner has asked me to share a few words today to put on the parliamentary record and I'll quote him. Lawrence was a quiet man, a deep listener. In a few words he always got to the heart of what mattered. In our party room he was often the last speaker and his wisdom, the final word. Costa loved his family, his culture, his people. He lived his faith. I always trusted his private counsel. His integrity was a North Star. He served because he wanted a better life for his people, safe, healthy, strong. Wise one, strong one, chiggy one. We will miss you, brother boy, but I know if we ever camp out on your country, we will see you there, from Michael Gunner. What some of the words that Michael Gunner hasn't shared with us today is the story that he said, Costa would ring me up and be talking away about an issue in his electorate and then he'd say, oh, here, I'll put so-and-so on the phone and he would just hand the phone straight <laughs> over to whoever it was that he was ringing on behalf of to former Chief Minister Michael Gunner put them on the spot and I'm not sure if our current Chief Minister has experienced that from uh, Mr Costa in her time. I want to acknowledge that there are many people who are here today to celebrate the life of our dearly beloved friend and I know that there are many who cannot be here today. I want to acknowledge a couple of people who I know have been very close in supporting Ebony and the family. Uh, Maddie Ellis, who became great mates working with Mr Costa and is now a very close family friend for Ebony. Thanks, Maddie, for all your support to Ebbs and the family, particularly when Mr Costa passed away. I know it was not easy on you, but you stayed strong and you have been the good friend that he has always loved. And I know it's been hard on the electorate staff for Mr Costa, Baden and Taddy, who are here today. The sudden passing of your boss so I hope you're healing in your time. To our parliamentary staff, our former and current staff, who have also deeply felt the loss of our dear friend, I hope you've been able to take the time to grieve this great loss for us all. A special acknowledgement to Peter Wellings, who is here in the gallery, who I know would get growled at and would growl him back, <laughs> but Mr Costa trusted you immensely 
And if Wello hadn't stamped it as a yes, then it was definitely not going to be a yes from Costa. Mr Costa can never be replaced. I feel for our newest team member, Manuel, whose election win would have been bittersweet. Bitter in the sense of having to campaign in a by-election after the death of Mr Costa. Sweet in the sense that Mr Costa would be saying, see, told you Mob Manny would win. The phone call to break the news of this loss, and I thank Chansey, who did a very good job of delivering some very sad news. And Ebony, I'm sorry I missed your call that day. I still feel very guilty that I missed your call. A really strange thing happened when Jetsy had called me that day. Well, I have a, a Tiwi painting in my house. And it's, it's in my, the, the main bedroom. I was playing with my daughter. And missed all the calls that day. But I had picked up Chancy because I'd seen it on my kitchen bench. And Chancy was ringing. And he said, are you on your own? I said, I can be. But popped into the room. And I went and stood against the wall next to that TV painting. Never done it before. Never done it since. And that's where Chancy delivered the news. I know that Mr Costa had a wide range of family and friends who have made him the special man that we are remembering today. Sydney and Gordon for travelling all the way from over in Maningrida. Special people to that man as well. To Ebony, Janita, thank you for sharing a very special man with us. He may not be here in person, but I know his spirit is still strong. To my friend, I miss you and I hope you have found peace on the shores of your beautiful homeland, sitting down, hopefully having a cup of tea, watching the sunset with your father. Rest in peace, old man. Deputy Chief Minister, you have the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I rise to speak about a great man, Mr Costa, a great bloke, a family man, a community man, a fabulous sense of humour, a teammate, someone who I'd say in politics you really value when you've got a friend who I'd consider low maintenance but a high return every time. And I tell you what, reliable is a word I'd use too. Whenever things got hard, he was always reliable. He's never let me down. An amazing teammate. When I first really met Mr Costa, I was actually sitting in a room at Mary River next to him realising I'm going to work with this bloke for the next four years and I actually don't know him. Don't know him. And I'm so glad that just a few weeks later I actually went out to Gumbalanya with him to go open up the new supermarket. And I took my staff member there at a time, a bloke by the name of Matt Ellis. And I'd like to claim myself to be the matchmaker, <laughs> the start of a beautiful bromance. And, um, and it was there that myself and my old mate, we really got to know each other on that trip. He was laughing at me because it's no secret in this house, I hate small planes. The worst part of this job for me is putting me in a small plane. I freak out every time. You want to see someone claw, claw a chair? I am the woman to be on a plane with. Uh, Mr Costa, laughing his head off, you just bounce around and everything's fine. And um, it, was, it was just nice to be able to break the ice, to get to know each other a bit better on that trip. But uh, for me to see firsthand what an effective Member of Parliament he was going to be. He won me over that day. He won me over big time. And it was the start of a special friendship that I'm so grateful that I had. Um, I really always did get along with him. We went on the phone to each other all the time and it was a bit like when we actually spoke to each other, we spoke to each other for a reason. And it was always a good conversation. Always a good conversation. I had a huge amount of time and respect for him. We really did have shared values, love of, love of our family, a love of our community and the sense of responsibility we took in, in the roles that we did. 
And I think it's fair to say that um, myself and Mr Costa also shared um, an absolute um, no time for disingenuous people, no time for muckrakers. Um, and we might have shared a bit of a love of using a few cuss words here and there <laughs> to express ourselves. It'd be fair to say. Um, he was a really highly effective member of this parliament. I don't think pe a lot of people got that or understood that. Um, at the end of my tenure as the treasurer and when I had a look back at the list of you know what people were getting done around the place and what projects were delivered and you looked at what Mr Costa was able to pull off in Arafura, it goes to show how effective he was. Um, he was effective at lobbying of putting the case forward for the need, for why things need to get done. This is a man that delivered a huge amount of houses in communities to fix up homelands and drive forward his passion for homelands and outstations and giving people a better life out there. We saw investment in art centres. We saw investment in change rooms. We saw um, investments going forward in healthcare clinics, renal, new clinics. <laughs> We saw uh, one of my favourite projects with them, car transporters. We saw barge landings fixed up. Critical infrastructure that makes just a fundamental difference to the lives, the quality of lives to people that he represented. So I would say he was absolutely first class, really effective. And you want to know the reason why he was so effective? It's because he did his job well, always in touch with the people, as so many have spoken about that infamous mobile phone, <laughs> which would have driven them absolutely crazy half the time. Um, but I'd like to reflect upon the famous road trips that he would do. Out on the car, on the road, off he goes with Paddy, Manuel or Maddie Ellis. Hit in the road, going out to speak to his constituents, to hear what they actually care about, what they want and what's going on on the ground. And who can forget his beautiful support of one of his other best mates, Baden? I know you're always there for me, mate. I don't know how much you're hurting. Always there in the electorate office for him. But turning to the thing that's most important in Lawrence's, or Mr Costa's life, was of course his family and the amazing wife, Ebony. When you got Mr Costa in the parliament, you actually got two for the price of one because you did get Ebony, an absolute rock, such a strong, amazing pillar of strength, always there to support him in everything he did, in the galleries, late at night, on the road, preparing him, being there for him, just being that solid rock of support. You are truly one of the most amazing women I've ever met and a wonderful role model of a wife, mother and grandmother. We're so proud of you, Ebs. We're so proud of you. We know he loved his dad. We loved his dad. Um, you know, I don't think he was ever the same after his dad passed, I have to say. Um, attending his father's funeral at the Holy Spirit Church um, and knowing the many years of struggle that his, his father had to the time of where he passed, um, but that broke his heart. I've never seen such a strong, beautiful friendship and love between a father and son before. Never in my life. It was powerful and it's a beautiful thing to remember. A beautiful thing to remember. Janita and the kids. The beautiful grandkids, he loved you so much. Always speaking about you with such pride, love and optimism. And, um, you know, you could see how much he loved being a father and a grandfather. And he was a good friend. We've all heard those stories. Good friend, good teammate, good bloke. So our, to our old mate, Rest in peace. You leave this world, but my memories of you put a big smile on my face. 
of so much happiness and joy that you brought to me, especially with some of the, some of the amusing things you used to put on the Facebook as well in the morning. <laughs> I always think of the one where he's got the cowboy hat on and the four different faces singing along. You know, he was just he was just such a fabulous person, and I like to think of him in this way. Um, you know, he might have left us now here, but like the chief minister said, I think of him sitting in heaven, looking down at picture mirror, sitting with his dad eating mud crab, telling stories, having a laugh and having a good time. Well, we're all here getting on with it, but he knows we all miss him and he knows he made a difference. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Member uh, Namajira. Oh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Now, Mr. Speaker, I, I rise to speak this condolence uh, motion this morning uh, about a man who was committed to his family and his country, Mr. Lawrence Costa. And I think if I called him Mr. Costa, he'd probably yell at me and say, that was my dad, not me. Look, I, I feel very honoured to be able to share uh, my thoughts today uh, with Ebony and the family uh, who are here with us in the chamber. I only got to know Lawrence since coming to this chamber in 2020, and I immediately took a liking to him. I found Lawrence to be a genuine man who felt strongly about his people and his country. Uh, he advocated for them in this chamber fiercely. I was lucky to be able to share more time with Lawrence on the Public Accounts Committee, which is where I got to know him far better. Uh, we had some good laughs and I certainly enjoyed his company immensely. I will always remember him talking about his beloved Tiwi Islands, uh, about its beauty and its culture, and I specifically remember him inviting me to come to the Tiwi Islands so he could show me the region and uh, introduce me to the people of the islands and, of course, uh, sneak in a little bit of sly fishing. <laughs> it was something that I'd always look forward to doing with Lawrence, uh, a day or two visiting the Tiwis, meeting the people, checking out the country that he felt so strongly about. But I also missed the chats about the bush, um, the people and the challenges they faced and how we could do better for them. And his depth of knowledge of the bush was vast. But not only that, we talked about the beauty in the bush and he had a great respect uh, for the place uh, that I call home in Central Australia and the beauty down there. Uh, he was certainly a Territorian that loved all things about the Territory. I feel privileged to have known him and uh, miss his input in this chamber uh, and the chats that we used to have. And I certainly miss the shouts across the chamber of you, that big, uh, that big deep, booming voice. Uh, it was always a, a great laugh. So again, my condolences to Ebony and the family, and the Territory is a poorer place without Lawrence in it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Member for Karama, give the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Today I stand proudly to contribute to this condolence motion to honour the legacy and memory of the late Mr Costa, and I thank his beautiful family, particularly his wife Ebony, daughter Janita, son-in-law Ben and their beautiful children, for allowing us to honour him in this way. Mr Speaker, um, the Deputy Chief Minister is not alone in only meeting Costa for the first time when we were pre-selected for the 2016 anti-general election, um, because I too had not met him. But just because I hadn't met him before then does not mean that I hadn't heard about him, for my dad provided a lot of background about Costa for my benefit. My dad told me that Costa was a formidable man who was Tiwi strong. He loved his family, his people, his land and his culture and that he had already fought extensively to protect these treasures in a variety of roles to ensure that they all prospered. I knew from my dad's words right then that Costa and I were going to be great friends and get along very, very well, and that we, were bound by our, we would be bound by our values and our passion to help others to live the life they deserve. And I was right, Mr Speaker. Since the moment he walked into the caucus meeting, he was a focal point, a magnet, we all gravitated towards him. Because even if we hadn't met him before our first gathering, we had all heard about Costa, the man, the myth, the legend, and we all wanted to be in his presence. I have to say, over the years, Costa's magnetism only grew stronger, and deservedly so. Because when he spoke, we all listened. We all wanted to listen to him. Because he knew, we knew that every time he spoke, he added value. And we all know that that is a rare trait these days. Mr Speaker, we know that Territory Labor has a proud history of pre-selecting Aboriginal people to serve in this parliament, to serve the people and the communities in which we reside. 
because we know how important it is to acknowledge and respect and include Aboriginal people in our discussions and decision-making processes, not only because we make up one third of the Territory's population, but because it always was, always will be Aboriginal land. I was proud to be elected in August 2016 alongside Costa and our brother boy Chancy Paik, who is now the Attorney General, and our, uh, and our sister girl Selina Yubo, who is the Minister for Housing. And I know that our brother boy Kenny Vowles, a former minister in the Michael Gunner Labor government, loved it when us four other black fellows joined him in the Labor caucus. Our first black caucus meeting was electric. And whilst I won't and can't share the details of a caucus meeting, I can tell you that having five Aboriginal politicians in their own meeting was very, very exciting. And we all felt it. We knew that we had the opportunity to work together as a group to serve our people in the best way, to ensure that our voices were heard in a way that only Labor could. Mr Speaker, all members of Black Caucus looked up to Costa. He was our big brother, our jokester. He made us laugh when we got too serious and he revved us up when we weren't serious enough. And we loved him for this. Costa shared stories about his family, his, uh, about his life, his family, his dad, or pop as he called him, his home of Pijamira and his sport. And we've heard, and I'll reiterate, how much he loved his Tigers, both in Maloo and Richmond. And he was in good company because there were a number of Richmond Tigers in our caucus. But above all, he kept it real, Mr Speaker. He reminded us constantly of the people who were relying on our important work to better their lives, and we loved him for this. Those who are and have served in Parliament sacrifice an incredible amount to do our job properly. And even when we suffer a great loss, and many of us have, we have to take a small amount of time to grieve and then get back to work because we know we have many people relying on our efforts to help make their lives better each and every single day. And I both understand and respect this. But when my dad passed away six weeks before the 2020 election, I crumbled. For my loss and my family's loss was not played out in private. <clears throat> but Costa was there to grieve with me. He had my back. He knew exactly what I needed to hear at that time, and he told me. Actually, all my team were great at that time. When we were re-elected in 2020 to serve for another four-year term in this parliament, we knew that we had a greater opportunity to help others. And we were so proud to watch our brother boy, Chancy Pate, get elevated to the cabinet alongside our great mate, Kate Warden two very deserving and wonderful local members who were ready to do more of the heavy lifting as ministers. And Costa loved his family. He loved sharing stories with us and had us in stitches from laughter. And he loved nothing more than spending time with his beautiful wife, Ebony, his daughter, Janita, son, Lord Ben, and their beautiful kids, and his pop. And it broke his heart when he lost pop. And we all felt that loss, as our team knew how much he loved his pop and how well he looked after him and how happy Pop was to see Costa fighting for his people and community again and again every single day in this role. And we were all rallying around Costa to grieve with him and attend Pop's funeral. Mr Speaker, I miss Costa every day, even more so when I walk into this pub. I miss his big smile, his sense of humour and his words of wisdom. And he really was a magnet. We all gravitated towards him, wanting to be in his presence because he was the influence you needed before you knew you needed it. He could be calming, compassionate, understanding and inspiring all at once. I have many stories involving Costa, as many others do, that I recall from memory when I'm having a bad day in this place and they always cheer me up. But I'm afraid, like others, they are not suitable for public record, Mr Speaker. So instead, I'll continue to relive them with, uh, with my caucus colleagues and with his beautiful family. To Eb, Janita, Ben, to Ariana and Baby Landon. Um, I send you the greatest love and best wishes from not only me, but from my mum, Gail, and my big brother, Jonathan, who loved Lock Costa as well. We will forever treasure Costa. We will forever treasure our memories of you and be inspired to keep serving our people. And we will continue to support Manuel, your successor as a member for Arafura, who was doing an amazing job looking after the electorate and you would be so, so proud. So see, sleep peacefully, big, big brother. We will miss you and we will love you always. Ma. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I'm also uh, extremely um, pleased um, to be able to contribute to the condolence motion today for the former member for Arafura, 
and, and I will refer to him as Mr Costa because that's all I ever called him. I do recall a day, and thank you Ebony for allowing us to use his first name, but I can't remember a time that I ever did. Um, I think I stood there one day trying to wonder about what was his first name <laughs> or was his first name actually Costa because indeed that is all I called him and it was from day one uh, in, from 2016 um, that we came together. And we did, we were backbenchers for our first four years and um, in this place and uh, those that were backbenchers together during that time, we had quite a fierce uh, friendship that grew. We were able to whinge together as backbenchers. We uh, constantly whinged about being backbenchers and how hard it was and scheming about how to get ministers to do our job. But don't worry, when I became a minister, he reminded me <laughs> and made sure that he would humbug us uh, about his electorate tenaciously. And then he'd want to show us, which was the biggest step. And um, I had an opportunity to travel with him out on his home country. And what I saw was, as others have reflected, that huge amount of respect that he got from people. But also I realised that he didn't just save telling off for us. He would tell people off all the time during those travels. And uh, that brought him great respect and he was a ferocious advocate for people. Um, but he, um, he left extremely big shoes to fill. Uh, the member for Arafura obviously walks in those every day and I respect that enormously. That he would be proud of the work that you're doing in this assembly. But that he did, um, as the member for Mulca said, those were my words as well, member for Mulca. He brought people together and uh, absolutely when he spoke we listened and so many have reflected on that today. And in fact, despite his age, and some of us are older than Mr Costa, he was our old man in caucus and nobody ever argued with that. And as I said, he told us off endlessly. Sometimes I didn't even know what I was getting told off for. But, um, and I'm not going to share a great number of stories. However, he would be in here telling me off. He'd be out there telling me off for biting my nails constantly. He would take those photos and send me of me biting my nails. He would text me with just a picture of a finger <laughs> telling me to stop biting my nails. And in fact, I didn't realise how useful he was until about two months after his passing when the NT News started printing photos of me biting my nails. <laughs> I should have listened and uh, clearly I learnt my lesson but I'm not sure every time I go to it, it's like, oh, I can't do that. But he, he did. He sent me endless photos. Um, and one of the great connections we had was over our dads. And uh, we often shared... Uh, what was going on in our lives. My dad was living with me um, when he was terminal and um, we shared and we would often just talk and stories of our dad. He felt losses very deeply um, and we shared those moments as did uh, the member for Kurama today around the losses of our fathers and uh, I think he uh, made me respect and um, spend some more time with my own dad over that time and he showed me how important that was so I really respected him for that. He absolutely loved his family. He talked about you endlessly. Um, he, um, his love for you, Ebony, was uh, ink so deep. It was just a beautiful thing to watch and when you see people that have those sorts of relationships, uh, you can only be envious. That's a beautiful thing um, that you had together. He also loved all his grandchildren that he never stopped talking about, Janita, you and your kids. Um, and when you welcomed your children into this world, they were, besides meeting Ebony, the happiest moments of his life. And he just radiated that joy to us. He couldn't wait to share that with us. We loved him. We loved his sense of humour. I can still hear that chuckle. It wasn't a laugh, it was a chuckle up in the corner in his chair. And... It's incredibly hard to say goodbye, incredibly hard. I think there were some very respectful um, tributes to him over that time, but he was absolutely taken too soon, and we respect and, and know that. So thank you, Mr Costner, for your service, your service to the Northern Territory, but particularly 
I want to thank him for his friendship. Rest in peace. Member um, for Drysdale, you have the call. Yeah, so I'm humbled to be able to stand in the Northern Territory Parliament and talk about the member for Arafura, um, a very special member of the Legislative Assembly. Um, and as I said, um, very humbled to have been a friend of Lawrence's. Um, I was older than Lawrence, and so um, we had a very respectful relationship. Um, I will um, acknowledge uh, Ebony and, and Janita as well as the Grandies. And um, like everybody said, um, every conversation I had with Lawrence, Ebony, he always spoke so highly and so loving, lovingly of you. But um, the work that you did to support Lawrence, you really did get a team when you got Lawrence. So um, lovely, to, lovely to see you again here today. Um, we've mentioned Maddie Ryan, but also Baden and Patrick, who are up there today. Um, again, you were part of a very special team for Lawrence. Um, you know, Lawrence would, um, like all of us, he'd let us know something that needed to be done out in the Tiwis or to be followed up. Um, you know, and it was then you guys that were the ones that we'd talk to to, to get the details and um, know the work that needed to be done. That, um, and as I said, you're always there to support him. So to Baden and Paddy up there, um, but also Maddie Ellis, um, thank you for supporting Lawrence. Um, parliamentarian jobs are hard jobs at times. Um, we all know that, all of us in here, but um, none of us can survive or do a good job without a wonderful staff um, and wonderful families. And Lawrence was very lucky and he had amazing staff and a wonderful family that were behind him every time. Um, I, I'm going to just talk about some of the, the stories um, with Lawrence. You know, the day I got the phone call, and I got the phone call from Natasha, um, it was late December, or about middle of December, I think it was the 17th of December, and I stood and cried. I, I cried and I wept for uh, the passing of such a good man, a really good man is the definition I would use. He was kind-hearted and we've heard that. He was funny. He would really, at the toughest times, make us all laugh. Um, he was a strong man, uh, physically strong, mentally strong, because I think probably there were so many, so many Tiwi people passed. We, we've talked about his father, we talked about Pop, um, but he had so many people that passed while he was a member of Arafura. Um, he was often having to go to the hospital um, you know, there'd be times in the house here that he'd be telling us that he had uh, a very close family member that he was having to go to hospital to support. Um, so he was a strong man, as I said, physically strong, but mentally strong as well. But then he had that really kind, compassionate, caring uh, father and grandfather part about him as well. But um, he also had an uncanny um, ability to read body language and to know people and work out people in an instant. Um, so he'd tell you that um, whether that was a good person that you were talking to or um, he, he had that ability to read people's body language, I think, um, and to see through people very, very quickly. And he would use that unparliamentary language to tell you about that person very quickly as well. But um, I think that came, and I know the um, member for Mulka talked about it, um, that growing up in that very bicultural environment, that both ways environment, meant that he could walk, walk in both cultures in such an amazing way. Um, and that was a very special talent of Lawrence's. As I said, I could have, I have so many stories. I went to the Tiwi Islands many, many times with Lawrence. But one very special memory I have um, was a trip to the Tiwis. It was early in my term as Minister for Education. And he got me over to the Tiwis and he organised everything on the ground. We, on the first morning there, we were at Muraputawanu and then St Francis Xavier College. And then we jumped in the four-wheel drive and went across to um, Pilangimbi to stay overnight with Ebony. Good old Ebony had, did all the cooking, cooked us tea and looked after us. But um, uh, we also went out to Pichamira. Um, and that truly is a, one of the most beautiful places in the Northern Territory. Um, Lawrence is at rest at Pichamira and I will always, when I think of Lawrence, I will think of Pichamira because um, it truly is an amazing homeland, an amazing outstation. Um, you have the long coast um, looking out onto the Tiwi, onto, sorry, the Timor Sea um, and Lawrence and I, we sat there, we, we spoke, it was a high tide and the sea was lapping on the coast there and the sun was setting and I don't think there's too many more beautiful places in the world than 
picture mirror at, at sunset on a high tide. You know, the breeze was blowing. And um, you know, we just talked about family uh, besides work and, um, uh, and pop um, as well. But it truly is a, the most beautiful places. And I was, feel very, very fortunate to have been able to go to picture mirror with Lawrence because that was such a part of him. It, um, that was his home. And he is now resting at Picture Mirror. And um, I, um, I feel um, contented to know that he's at Picture Mirror because I know how happy he'd be there and um, to be there with Pop because that was a place that really did make him feel feel happy. Um, Lawrence took me to uh, then Pelangimbi School and he organised um, he organised Morris Purim Tata Mary to and some of the other um, elders there uh, to dance to do a dance when I, and welcome me to pitch uh, to uh, Pelangimbi School. Um, Sue Hyson was the principal. Sue and Marty Hyson, who I'd I'd worked with Marty at Jingley, so I knew the principal and the teaching staff there. But it was a beautiful morning to have the dancers and the kids at Pelangimbi School um, welcome me. And as I said, that was something very very special that Lawrence did um, for me, as um, you know, and respectful. Uh, he respected me, obviously as I said, as an older person than him, but also as a Minister for Education. And it was a very beautiful thing to be able to, um, to have a welcome at, at, the, at the school. On another time, I went out to Millicarpity with Lawrence as well. And for those who don't know, Millicarpity, I think, is one of the best art galleries um, in the Northern Territory, an amazing art gallery. It's often a bit hard to get to Millicarpity because you, you're either flying there or you're, you're crossing on the... Aspley Strait and driving to get to Millicarpity. And I was with Lawrence, we went to the school of course, and, um, but then we went to the art gallery. And Lawrence bought a stunning, a stunning picture, and I'm sure he's still got it, um, we've still got it. It was a, a huge big painting, uh, a modern, a very modern Aboriginal art uh, piece of, um, uh, of a deity, um, I presume a modern interpretation of, of God. Um, and but it was a just a truly stunning piece of Aboriginal art um, in the, the the you know the ochre black and white colours of the Tiwi people, um, but a very special piece of art. Um, I also bought a, a print a print of the Eiffel Tower, which had an amazing story to it. Um, a, a, one of the artists had been to Paris and got lost lost in Paris uh, for a few days, and um, it had. had and there's, as I say, a much longer story about that, but I have a print in my lounge room of the Eiffel Tower by a, a Tiwi artist, which um, I hold dear. But um, Lawrence will be forever loved by all of us here. He, and we've all said that, we were the team of 2016. We all started our political careers with Lawrence. Um, he was a loyal, absolutely loyal man, very loyal to Michael Gunner. Um, wouldn't, um, you know, very loyal to all of us as ministers, but um, worked so hard for his electorate. And people have spoken today um, as infrastructure minister, you know, you'd have those phone calls from Lawrence. My last, um, the last bit of work that I did with Lawrence, um, as I said, we obviously had lots and lots of uh, conversations, but the last bit of work that I did with Lawrence was around Picatarama School, um, and Baden will know this. So towards the end of last year, pick of Taramore School, which is a um, independent school on um, on the Tiwi Islands, um, the board and the, the principal had run into some trouble, big trouble really for the school, um, trouble that involved finances and governance and things like that. And Lawrence was just such a good local member. He inserted himself into that. He brought people together. Um, he brought all of the board over to um, to here, to, to Darwin. They all met in my office. I pulled the education department, the register of non-government schools in. Um, we sat down. We were able to get a resolution um, around a, a whole heap of things that needed to be done. Um, and the department then worked through that. And you know, the school by the beginning of this year is back in a strong place. And that's what a really good local member can do. <coughs> Lawrence knew what he needed to do. He needed to get the people to, be, to meet with me. He needed decisions to be made. He needed um, me as a minister to hear um, directly from the people involved. Uh, and that was Lawrence, who was a classic example of, some, uh, of a, a local member sorting something out with a minister 
getting a resolution and moving something forward. And um, But that was Lawrence all over. He knew when he needed to step in. Um, he knew when somebody was, and we'll say the word, bullshitting him. <laughs> as I said, he had that uncanny ability to know that. Um, and as I said, he truly was a, a magnificent, and I'll use that word, a magnificent human being and one that we all dearly loved. So to, to Eb, um, yes, a very special man, and to Janita and all the grannies and families. Um, we miss Lawrence every day. Um, the Attorney General spoke of that. We have a seat in the lobby that won't be filled. Um, it will remain always a seat for Lawrence. Uh, and we feel, his, we feel his presence. And I know when we uh, ma are making decisions in there, I will often think, what would Lawrence think about this? What would his views be on this? Um, but it's a seat that will go unfilled um, for us as a Labor government. Uh, but to everybody here, thank you to everybody that's come today. It's an absolute pleasure. And as I said, I'm humbled to be able to stand and talk about Lawrence Costa. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Member Daly, you have the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And today I rise to pay my respects to the great man, Mr Costa, today. Um, to Ebony and Janita, I'd just like to thank you for sharing such a beautiful human, someone with such a kind heart, and he was always there for people no matter what walk of life they'd come from. He was always so generous with his time and always would give great advice, and I'd just like to thank you for sharing him with us um, for myself, I remember coming to Parliament House first in 2018 when I um, applied for a job here in Parliament House. I'd never really been in the political system uh, before that and um, it was quite intimidating uh, coming to Parliament. You would see a lot of uh, the, well, the politicians on TV, uh, the Chief Minister uh, on TV and walking up there, it was quite an intimidating place. Um, but I remember uh, when Mr Costa uh, walked down the aisle while and he's like, hey, bros, how you going? And I'm there like, oh, yep, I'm good. And um, he just really lightened that mood for me and was uh, made me realise that, you know, even though we're in these jobs that we are all just people and we're working for the people, and he really just uh, confirmed that uh, for myself. But also um, organising one of my first trips out bush um, as a worker, two men and greeter, uh, it was. Um, and he'd rang me up and he said, hey, I heard you're going out to men and greeter. I said, yeah, heading out there, got some stakeholder meetings. And he said, well, why haven't you let me know? <laughs> and I learned very quickly as a staffer mm. that when you go into someone's electorate, <laughs> you quickly let them know as the local member. Um, so anyway, he said, well, I'm going to come out with you and he'd changed his diary around um, and we were with, I was with Matty Ellis actually as well and um, no surprises there as the uh, Deputy Chief Minister just said um, and we were, um, funnily enough I got someone calling me from Meningrader now, what <laughs> a princess, Nalletta McKenzie. Um, so yeah, um, we were heading out bush and you know being a black fella from the east coast of Yamba, New South Wales, he really wanted to figure out who I was um, and where I'd come from and my story of moving up to the Northern Territory. Um, and I'd told him my story and I'd lived in Wadea for four and a half years. Um, but one thing um, we quickly figured out was that um, Uncle Des, Ebony's dad, and my dad, the cousins. Um, so we'd built that connection pretty quickly. Um, and that was through the old ATSIC days. Um, and since then, you know, not having a lot of family up here, I've got my brother Birrigan, I've got a couple of cousins that live here, um, and it was great to figure out we had more cousins living here. Um, but he would always just check in to see how I was going, and it just felt, you know, we really had a strong connection, and he would just always check in, and it was his family as well. Um, so that was really special to me, and I've... Um, Really miss those phone calls. They do to check in, um, but it really means a lot. Um, but heading out to Men and Greeter, um, you know, as a, as a member for Arafura um, mentioned, 
Um, it must have been a tradition of his because we were driving out and I remember needing to go to the, the toilet. <laughs> and I laughed and he brought this up and I'm thinking, oh, here we go. This reminds me of something. Um, but a little bit different, but I'm there going, you know, I need to go to the toilet. And he didn't stop. And I'm, I'm busting in the car and I'm sitting there and he's, he's, I think he was testing me, testing my patience out. <laughs> um, so we're sitting there and he finally pulls up and I, I get out and, you know, I do my business and I go to the toilet. And as I go to get back in the car, he drives off. <laughs> and I'm, you know, half jogging down the road thinking it's, you know, all right, he's going to stop. He didn't stop. He went two, three hundred metres down the road, made me run the whole way. <laughs> then I thought, all right, go to get in the car again. He takes off again. Um, and then I'm, I'm chasing the car and again, and I, he did it about three or four times. I think I would have ran about 600, 700 metres. And then I get in the car and I, I get there and he's like, well, you're talking about all this running you're doing. So I just thought I'd see how fit you are. Uh, and he'd really test me out and I'm sweating. I got dust from the car because he took off pretty quick. He really put dust in my face. But anyway, um, being the cheeky person he is, um, we, we had a laugh the whole way and him and Matty Ellis just thought it was hilarious the whole time and I, I didn't ask to go to the toilet again since then. I knew to go before so or when we'd stopped. So um, that was a really uh, special moment uh, there and one of my first trips as a, as a uh, staffer there as well. Um, and another, um, you know, something that really um, Mr Costa would see, he, he never saw his position as a status um, and I remember I think it was around 2019, 2020, um, I was with um, the Deputy Chief Minister, Nicole Manison. We were flying out to Owen Pelly. You were the police minister at the time. Um, it was quite a bumpy trip. Um, I hated those small planes too. Uh, that was something we had in common. And I'd, I'd get anxiety over it. I still do. Um, but we were, we were flying out there and I remember coming into Owen Pelly and flying over those beautiful floodplains out there and flying in um, and we could see Matty Ellis was there again with Mr Costa, we could see them both there standing at the car. Um, he had his 200 series there parked up at the airport as we're flying in and we, we, we get out and I remember he's there in his shorts, shirt, barefoot and he had the senior sergeant there from Owen Pelly. Um, and we both walk out and, and, you know, usually when you greet ministers or chief ministers, um, you do it in a certain way, you know, introduce them by, oh, you know, this is the senior sergeant and uh, this is a deputy chief minister. Not Mr Costa. He's like, I think that, uh, um, the memory there, but I think the senior sergeant's name was Chris or someone and he's like, Chris, meet Mano, Mano, meet Chris. <laughs> and that was... Mr. Costa all over. He just um, he kept it very light-hearted, but at the at the same time, um, you know, he, he didn't see anyone as above him or below him. He kept it very honest, and that's something I take away uh, from him. So, um, yeah. In closing, um, thank you again just for um, sharing him um, with us. Um, it's it's a very special friendship, um, family that I consider, um, and yourself, cuz, thank you. Um, and yeah, I still remember the phone call when you called me. My brother and I were in Larimer, pulling over for a stop. Um, and yeah, asking us to come and see him at the house, and we weren't able to. But it's, it's still hard and I wish we were closer, but we'll always remember his, his beautiful soul and may he rest in peace. Thank you. Uh, member for Kajarina, you have the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, I too rise to pay my respects and to honour uh, a great man, um, somebody who was a great friend to all of us in government, um, Lawrence, and to give my condolences um, to you, Eb and Janita, and your beautiful um, babies. Um, we've already heard through the motion today the legacy that Lawrence leaves, um, the decades of hard work for the Northern Territory and for his people. 
his unwavering commitment and passion for delivering on the issues that impacted on people across the communities of Arafura. And that's really apparent and uh, through the motion today and of course for anyone who's ever had the privilege to meet him. And all of us will continue to remember Lawrence really fondly as a colleague, as a friend and um, more so like family. And I remember um, Lawrence often referring to us as that, reminding us in caucus that we were like family. And when you spend particularly fortnights like this in sittings where we spend more time with each other than we do with our families, um, he was always that person who just really brought it back down to that, that it was about supporting each other, backing each other in. Um, you get to know each other, you get to know each other's loved ones and we all formed a really special bond with him. And I think, uh, you know, I won't be saying anything that, that people haven't already said um, because we all had that really special experience of him from the first minute you meet or met Lawrence, um, he had that calming presence that instantly just put you at ease and it um, didn't matter whether we had decades of a relationship with Lawrence or we just met him uh, heading into um, 2016. He just, he instantly put you at ease. He was just such a good person uh, with an absolute heart of gold and an absolutely wicked sense of humour. And it was never unusual to see Ebony here at Parliament House, um, you know, or sometimes sitting up there in the glass uh, gallery or um, in the lobby with the grandbabies. Um, supporting him uh, while he was delivering speeches and just doing the work um, that he did. And uh, his prolific Facebook pro posting that's been touched on today was reflective of that as well. And um, I can just see in the forefront of my mind beautiful wedding photos um, of you, Eb and Lawrence, um, beautiful pictures uh, in gorgeous water holes. Um, Janita went to little, um, just enjoying family time and or his cheerful morning or evening quotes just to ensure that everyone got out or in of, to bed on the right side <laughs> and a delicious meal that sometimes involved goose. Uh, <laughs> so he took pictures of everything, um, I think it's fair to say. And of course uh, uh, he posted often about his father and we know that that had a huge and, and lasting impact on Lawrence and uh, as a team, we all worked really hard to, to support him through that as well, knowing that impact that it had on him. Um, but I always found that his Facebook posting um, added a really nice reflection on life and a huge difference to some of the things that you often find on social media. It really reflected his approach to life. For those of us who welcomed babies into the house during Lawrence's time, um, the member for Arnhem, the former Chief Minister, Michael Gunner, and myself, I think um, we saw that family side of Lawrence in his interactions with our babies um, and tiny people. Um, he was, he just had a way, he could interact with anybody. It didn't matter uh, how old they were, but he, you know, he just, he had an affinity with um, little ones and I've no doubt he would have already forged a bond with, uh, with Phoenix as well, um, Selena. As uh, again has been noted today, Lawrence's phone was the busiest I think any of us have ever seen. Um, I sat in front of him, so I could constantly hear it uh, vibrating on his table. Uh, <laughs> um, there was always someone giving him a call for a chat or to seek help. Um, he was always available, he was always across what was going on. And he had a really big sense of immediacy for someone who was so calm. Um, you know, he would, I had education for a time, I, digital and corporate services, sport, things that, uh, that Lawrence was very passionate about. Um, and he would call and say, can you meet with so-and-so? And you'd say, yes, of course. And he'd say, great, well, they're in town. So, uh, and they leave tomorrow. So, you know, <laughs> you go, great, okay. Um, rearranging my day here. But, um, but no, he was very good at making sure things happened. And it would be of no surprise then that um, Myself and Lawrence and Lawrence and my office spent an awful lot of time on the phone talking about telecommunications in particular um, and of course sport but um, one of the best days that I remember having um, with Lawrence was uh, heading out to the islands to announce the Vocus subsea um, cable 
connecting Darwin and the Tiwi Islands, laying the foundations for better communications, something that he fought really hard for um, because he didn't get enough phone calls. So um, <laughs> we had the Vocus execs coming out um, as well. They were very excited. Um, it was a really big project. It was a really big investment and that wasn't lost on him. And we went over and on the same day we, um, we joined community members in the Tiwi Islands Regional Council to open the new change rooms there as well. So it was a massive day. And Lawrence was one of the first to place his handprints really proudly on the wall of those change rooms. So it was, it was a really beautiful day of pride and celebration for the community and um, I think it's fair to say that everyone, including the Vocus team, largely because of Lawrence's energy, um, were mostly excited about the footy element of the day, <laughs> rather than the um, rather than the major subsea cable um, announcement. Um, I think they actually ended up sponsoring the team. So um, it was a really beautiful day, and it was one of those days when you get home from work and you go, "That was a bloody good day." And coming together and celebrating the things that are important to communities is such an important part of why we do what we do, and it was certainly why. Lawrence did what he did. And I feel that about most of the days, um, when I think about the days I went out with Lawrence to communities, whether it was to visit a child and family centre or to the Tiwi Grand Final for the first time, a school visit or meeting his local ranger groups or an art centre, um, you always came home thinking that was a bloody good day. Um, he was really embedded in his community. He had a really great ability to hone in on what the issues were and what was required to fix it. Um, he definitely brought out the cheekiness in people and his disposition always helped people to see the strength um, in communities and the positives and the humour in life. Uh, here in the chamber, it's fair to say, and it's probably something to do with routine, um, but I, I hear him often, I hear his voice often, I think about him a lot um, in here. Uh, it became habit for us uh, who sit over here, um, to kind of sing each other's surnames in time with the bells and don't ask me why. I'm pretty sure Lawrence started it. Um, but I often hear his voice um, when the bell bells go. And um, sitting here with Lawrence for a considerable amount of time, I know he certainly helped myself and the member for Drysdale are uh, often in absolute stitches. Um, you, you know, people have talked about how he growled them. He would literally growl back here. Sometimes you'd actually hear a literal ground um, or a quick comment if he thought something ridiculous had been said, which was fairly often. Um, and he just loved the banter. Um, he loved the banter amongst his caucus colleagues and he definitely brought it in spades. Um, I think we all still, still, you know, try and bring that, uh, that laughter and that fun um, here and I think, you know, that's, that's very much what he would have wanted us to do. So it's no surprise to me that he enjoyed uh, respect and friendship across the chamber. It's just a testament to the kind of man that he was. Um, and we all come here every day knowing that there'll never be another person like him. And um, it was really hard thinking about what to say today because I think, um, you know, when I look up at the people who are here today and I know I, I bump into people at different times and I think it's still really raw for, for everyone. Um, we miss him deeply. We will always miss him. And every time I think about him, it's really hard to hone in on those really specific memories because the thing that, the, you know, the main image is just talking about really important things and talking complete nonsense over his big cups of tea um, in the lobby. And I still have a pannequin that he brought back from a festival. <laughs> Well, yeah, he did have pumpkins with his face on them too. Um, but, you know, I'm sure um, we've all, you know, when we have a cup of tea and we sit in the lobby that we, um, we think of him and some of those conversations we had. Um, he always had a way, even when he was going through really challenging times, of um, checking in on other people and doing it in a way that, um, you know, he was really careful not to, um, not to pry but just to let people know that he was there. And I think we all... Um, we all knew that about him and um, it's something each one of us will absolutely um, treasure and miss. Um, to Em, um, to all of you, uh, you always have friends and family in us um, and we will miss him deeply um, and continue to miss him deeply every day. Yeah. Yeah.
<coughs> uh, Member for Fanny Bay, with the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And there's been some wonderful stories this morning that I didn't even know about. So that's been, been amazing. And they say, uh, Mr. Speaker, the measure of a man is the worth of the things that he cares about. And as we heard from the Attorney General, family, country, and culture. And I think that's a fantastic measure of the man that was Mr. Costa. Um, Mr. Speaker, unlike many of my Labor colleagues, uh, my time with Mr. Costa really was from the moment I got elected into the House. And it's fair to say I did meet him and know him uh, as an advisor like, like you did, Duran. Uh, but I reckon in the two years that I was up there, I only bumped into him probably two or three times. And it was a testament because he was always out. Like you could never, you could never nail him down to, to catch him in person. It was always on the phone. And I probably contributed a few times uh, to his phone ringing, um, following up on things that, that he needed fixed. And to be fair, the only time I ever heard from Costa was when we probably missed something that he needed repaired or, or fixed for the deputy chief, and he definitely let us know about it um, when we'd call. Um, but it, it really, it really was when I when I came into Parliament um, that I got to know uh, Mr. Costa and. He was a man of service, as everyone has rightly pointed out today. Um, and you know, you'd, you'd be very hard pressed to find anyone that served his people better than him. He was always out doing what he undisputedly did best, and that was representing the good people of Arafir. And I know that um, many will do, or look up to do exactly what he did. And they are big shoes to fill, but um, he had the faith in you as we do, Manny. He put his constituents first and foremost. Uh, he was a no-nonsense individual. And as everyone has said here today, when he spoke, you listened, and it was insightful, and it was probably always right. Um, that chair in that room isn't the same. No one will ever sit in that seat. That is his uh, in that room. And it, it's ironic that where he put it has like a level of dominance in that room. You know, he didn't even have to talk. He wasn't LGB before he came into Parliament. But when he sat there, it was just like he picked the perfect spot to dominate the room. Uh, he's back to the corner and he could see everyone. He could see who was coming in and who was coming out. He'd get the shut the door uh, very loudly from him. Um, I'm going to talk to two examples, Mr. Speaker. One will be professional, one will be about his larrikinism. Um, there was one ex there's one example, Mr. Speaker, where during our parliamentary accounts committee, which uh, the member from the Majira spoke of, uh, during the local decision making hearings, I, I remember I got told, give him a call, make sure he's good to go for the plane tomorrow. And um, so I give him a call. And he's like, no, no, can't go. I've got some constituent issues to deal with. And I, at first, I thought it was a bit weird because I was like, parliamentary account, accounts committee, first and foremost. Like, that's what you, you got to do. But what I didn't realise, it wasn't until halfway through we were doing the, the hearings, that um, he was putting his job first and foremost, which was his constituents. And then when we got to you know, catch up at Parliament next time, I sort of said to him, it wasn't until halfway through I realised that Bush constituents have a different set of needs to what town constituents have. And then we obviously led into a discussion on that. And um, that leads me to my second one, Mr Speaker, which was, I'm very punctual. Army taught me to be five minutes before the five minutes. He took great pleasure in getting into the caucus room before me. And, <laughs> And I always thought, and n now that I'm, you know, he's not here, I'm the first person there. Um, but he was always in the room first, in that corner, and he'd smile at me, and he'd go, not today. And um, I think he, he knew that my OCD went into overdrive on that a little bit. Um, and so I'd try and get there a little bit earlier, a little bit earlier, and then there was a hard shoulder that I couldn't get past, which was school drop-off. So he always, he was always there, I, I assume, before school drop-off. Um, but I cherish those five minutes that we'd get before everyone else would come in. And as a young member of parliament, there's not as much, prof we don't have like a professional development stream that you go and learn on, you, you learn as you go. Um, but he was a really good set of, um, he was a guiding hand. He gave me those five minutes, I could ask him whatever I wanted. I'm not gonna talk about what we spoke about because like many have said in this house, it was colorful. Um, <laughs> and, and, and to be honest, some of it was just chewing the fat. Um, but it was a good five minutes, so we got to sit there, I got to speak to an old hand at the back bench who had no other aspiration than to serve his people. He didn't want to be a minister. He knew he was best served uh, out in country. Um, and then just before, or well, after Christmas, obviously, we were going to have a caucus meeting in Alice Springs, and we'd all agreed, I think all of the blokes had agreed we'd drive down. Uh, we'd do this big road trip, and the, the goal was to get to Barclay and stop in and see the members of Barclay. <laughs> because... Because every time we'd sit here, if it wasn't the members of Barclay yelling out, what about the Barclay? It was the, the member for Arafu advocating for the people of the Barclay as well. So the, the, the plan was to drive down and stop and, and do a bit of spontaneous doorstop and say, lady, and get a photo and be a bit cheeky on Facebook. But um, <laughs> unfo uh, unfortunately, uh, we didn't get to do that. Um, yeah, we didn't get to do it. Um, so we flew down. We had caucus uh, that way. But... Um, 
we, did, we didn't get that opportunity, but but it is it is what it is. Um, very grateful to have had the guidance from Costa to his family, Yuri, heart and soul. That's, as everyone has said, that's that's not in dispute. Um, but his but his people in Arafura are well looked after now uh, with yourself money. Uh, Vale, Mr. Costa, until we uh, meet again. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, for Port Darling. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and it is an absolute privilege to be able to stand. Um, Ebony, Danita, family, it's a bit hard to turn around. I would love to be able to face you while I'm talking, but um, I'll see Mr. Costa. I'll, uh, I've just asked permission to call him Costa. Um, one, because Bex sent some messages through, and that's how she's relayed to him. And also, that's just the way that we relate to each other, and it would seem disingenuous for me to call him anything else. Um, like a lot of us and most of us in the in the chamber on this side, we first met in 2016. Didn't see much of each other during during the campaign. Uh, so. Uh, as the member for Wanguri said, it wasn't until we started to spend some time together and, and even do some uh, do some trips that we got to know each other uh, a little bit better. Uh, and certainly, just just an absolute privilege uh, and honour to be sworn in into this chamber on the same day. Now, our, our current chief minister used to then be the leader of government business. I, I was the the government whip, so my job was to make sure everybody was in here when they needed to be in here, and everybody was speaking when they needed to speak. Now, Lawrence didn't like to speak unless he had something to say. So it was always a bit of a challenge uh, to get Mr Costa to speak, um, unless he was really passionate about that matter. And then speak he did and, and listen we did. And it was impossible not to hear him. He had that commanding, booming voice. Obviously, the member for Goida was the speaker at the time. So it was, Madam Speaker. and the tables just about shook and everybody listened and everybody knew that it wasn't going to be um, anything other than the absolute truth that he would talk. Look, Evan Eels, uh, along with your family, Wello, Berrigan, Paddy, Baden, you, you meant the world to him, you really did, and, and obviously a number of others that have been mentioned here today, uh, the, the travelling and the stories that, that Matty Ellis uh, would come back with were absolutely hilarious. But it wasn't just when they were travelling either. Being government whips, my, my job to know where he was at all times. And I'd have people text me at different times of the day or the afternoon, just after question time, going, hey, you, you bloke's still in Parliament? Go, yeah, 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 we're still in here. You go, oh, I've just seen Maddie and, uh, and Costa down the street <laughs> punching a dart or doing something. <laughs> what are they doing? Tell them to get back here. My God, they were always... A little bit cheeky and a little bit sneaky, and his um, his capacity to make us laugh, uh, as as the members have said, particularly over in this corner where you could just hear what he was saying. We shared a love of footy. Uh, obviously, the Tigers in in many different forums were were his absolute passion. Um, I'm a Crows fan, so in 2017, when when Richmond absolutely obliterated the Crows in an AFL Grand Final, it was a, a pretty sad day for me, and a day that Lawrence didn't really ever let me forget, thankfully. But um, always in a very uh, very light-hearted way, and if he if he knew no other way than to try and break the monotony on the day, he'd go, Kurt, you got any lollies? You got any snakes? Or how's them tigers? How's them tigers going? He would always know how to uh, how to break that monotony or how to lighten that mood. It, yeah, it was really really interesting. In 2021, he invited me over to to, to the Tiwi Grand Final. Just uh, such an honour, such a privilege to be able to to go over uh, and and just watch the Grand Final. And he went, no no no, Kirk, Kirk, you're a minister. You got to come out, toss the coin. I went, no, 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 Lawrence, you're the local member. I can't do that. You, you have to do that. And he goes, no, 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 you're minister. You're minister. You, you go out. You... So he talked me into it. And about five minutes before uh, the umpires and, and the captains came together for the coin toss, he just started pouring, absolutely pouring. And I saw Costa afterwards and I said, mate, Russ, I got, I got soaked when I went out to toss the coin. He said, yeah, I know, it rains every time. Just put the coin toss. That's why I asked you to go out. <laughs> All oh, right, yeah, no, no worries, thanks. <laughs> but if you paid him the respect to actually sit 
and listen. What he did explain to me later on was that I think it was the Bulldogs and the Tigers playing that day. And he had family on both sides. And he just didn't want to be put in a position of seeing to favour anybody. Like everybody knew he was a Tigers man. But when I sat with him quietly and asked him the real reason why he asked me to toss the coin, it was because he didn't want to let anybody down in his community. And if he happened to throw the, the, the coin and, and the particular team that won the toss won the game, somebody might think, you know, there was something in it. So he just said, no, nah, Kerb, you do it. And he made light of it at the time. But if you took the time to sit and listen and learn from the beautiful man, he had so much to teach you. Um, what he did teach me, I guess, was it's easy to say and it's, and it's a saying that we often use and it's probably been used a couple of times this morning. Is family is everything. But it, but it absolutely was. Because to him, once we'd met, once we were friends, you were then his family. There was no escaping that. And, and it was amazing to me here, some of the connections, uh, my wife, Beck uh, was originally from, from the New South Wales coast, very, very similar place to where, to where Ebony grew up and where Ebony and Costa spent some time. So it was beautiful uh, to know that we had some sort of connection with, their, with that country as well. But such a deep thinker and such a good explainer of how far and wide the fingers of relationships through the Northern Territory ran and, and how far and wide uh, the family relationships, not just through his country, but through everybody's country. And if you actually took the time to sit and listen to him, it was so beautiful to have him uh, explain that. As we said, beautiful sense of humour. Uh, as a few have said, <laughs> he didn't suffer fools very much. He kept his, uh, kept his comments pretty quiet. You know, he wouldn't ever disparage anybody in a public forum or anything like that. But um, if you'd upset him, you absolutely knew. But family is everything meant to him that if we were ever meeting about something that was really tough and Lawrence took command of those minutes, he would remind us that whatever we were working through, that would be an issue and it would come and go. But we don't come and go, that we were family. And that's when family is everything, that's what it meant. It meant all of his community, all of his workmates, all of his friends and family and all of us. And that's what it meant to him. Um, I will just read, with the indulgence, uh, the couple of words that Beck has put down because she couldn't be here today. To my dear brother Costa, we are nearing the first anniversary of your sad passing and your gentle presence is so sorely missed. A considered man, your thoughts, actions and visions were always driven by your will to be better and to do better for those you care for. You gave so many reasons for your family, your comrades and your community and your people to be proud. Your strength, your resilience and your story will be shared and felt for years to come. That'll be your legacy. Thank you for your friendship. Thank you for your guidance. Thank you for your care and respect. Thank you for our long chats and for so many laughs. And it's because Beck and, Leo, uh, Beck and, and Costa got to, to work a bit together and got to uh, visit a few communities together. So I just did promise that I would put that on the record. Look, a, a couple of the, the trips also that I had the opportunity to do um, was out to Man and Greeter. And I know that Lawrence felt so at home uh, at Man and Greeter. And, and as he did with all country, had a, a, a very spiritual connection to the country out there and he would always he would try and do his best to explain sort of what he was going through in walking in in two worlds uh, in the western world and also in his cultural world he'd never overstep the mark and tell you uh, too much but he he explained to me one day that out there on country there had been some things happen that you just couldn't explain to anybody and it really always resonated with me that it meant so much to him to be out on country um, Again, he didn't mind uh, teasing people out on country and I was with Matty Ellis and him one day and we decided uh, we were there for a couple of days at Manangredi. We were going to get up early and go out and flick a couple of lures really, really early in the morning as the sun was coming up. It was going to be beautiful. So he drove us down to this spot. Me and Matty were out just standing on this rock ledge 
the tide was pretty full, we're flicking these lures and, and Costas is sitting in the car. You go, I wonder what's going on. Lawrence, you want to come and have a go? And he goes, no, 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 I'm right, I'm right. So I walked up to the car. Lawrence, you sure? You want to come and have a go? And he said, no, don't be stupid, there's crop just here. I'm not going down there. <laughs> you, know, well, you could have told us that before, Brass. <laughs> but that's just the sort of guy that he was. He was such a passionate man, such a beautiful man. I've rarely met uh, such a beautiful soul. And Ebony, as everybody has said, sorely missed, not easily replaced. Manny, he would be so, so proud of the work that you're doing and continuing that work in representing all of the people and all of those communities. But Ebony, as people have said, we'll always be here for you and with you. Such a beautiful man. Thank you for the opportunity to contribute. Rest in peace, dear Costa, uh, on your homelands with your beautiful dad. We know you've deserved that very, very well-earned rest. Uh, Member for Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Hello, Ebony. Hello, family. Um, Mr. Lawrence Costa Vale, old man, and I know Baden and Patty are here who worked with him. Um, my condolences to you as well, fellas. Um, Costa, he was a son, a husband, father, grandfather, respected leader, but as we've heard today, he's also a good friend, a good friend of many. Um, I used to sit over there as well, it was great. <laughs> and to be, to be honest, he didn't really like sitting in this place much. So at any chance he'd got, he'd slip off into the lobby um, and we'd go in there and uh, we'd have a chat and he'd always say, oh, what about Daniel? And, you know, and then more recently, what about, what about Morris Jr? Um, and we'd start talking about the Tigers and we'd start talking about this week upcoming. Um, I got to this place at a fortunate time, just after the Richmond had pants, the Crows in that, that wonderful 2017 grand final that we remember so fondly, Curbs. Um, and... <laughs> And not only had Richmond done that in 2017, they'd had success in 2019. And so I got here on the wave, the crest of the wave of a dynasty, and we shared it together in the lobby most of the time. It was truly sensational because then in 2020, they backed it up and we had another, another celebration to share. Um, he liked to share these stories and have these yarns over a bacon egg sandwich. Want to, want to grab a bacon egg sandwich? I'd be always like, yeah, 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 no worries, we'll, we'll have one. So we'd, we'd sit in there and we'd have a bacon egg sandwich and we'd have a chat about the Tigers. Um, and it, it came to me, you know, when we, when we visited the community um, for the funeral of just the immersed culture and family in the Tigers. Um, to see in the store there all the pictures of, of Willie Rioli and Daniel and Cyril and Morris Jr. and everything. It, it really just hit me that day and it was, it was, um, it was unfortunate that we were there for that, that time. It would have been much better to be spending more time there. Um, but Ebony, you know and, and we all know he's had an impact on so many people in this place, um, but far and wide. Um, you know, the, the touch that he had even goes to St Bede's in, in Melbourne, you know, like strangely enough, I've got family friends who went to St Bede's College with Lawrence um, during that, that time when he was at school in Melbourne and, and Mick Pisasali, who's friends of, friends of ours, still, you know, every year we sort of catch up down in down in Big Harbour, talks fondly of that time that he spent, you know, he was making an impact on lives when he was such a young fella. Um, so it's been, it was, it was a pleasure um, to get to know him, to, to work with him, to sit with him over there um, and to share a, a common bond with the tiger. So I've, I've written a poem. Um, my colleagues know I'm, I'm a, you know, a, a poet. They wouldn't know it, um, but I've written a poem. Um, <laughs> I've written a poem. It's, 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 um, it's not my finest work. Um, but I, I hope I hope you can you can hear the, the, the beat of this drum. O Costa, he's from Tiwi Land. A gentle giant, he's from Tiwi Land. In any in any weather you would see him in pain on a light or small plane. If up high he'd always sigh, this flight must be for my sins. Oh he's from Tiwi Land. He never weakened till the final song. Like Costa of old, he was strong and so bold. He's from Tiwi land, yellow and black. My condolences to you, Ebony, and the family, and Vale Lawrence Costa. Yeah. Thank you, Member Johnson. Um, 
This 14th Assembly has seen for many across the Chamber some loss of family members at trying times that have been very, very painful. None more than the loss of Marani. Ebony, Juanita, Ben. As many in here have found this morning, it's very difficult to speak about our great friend. From the moment he's passing when you called me, I'm reminded everywhere in this building of his presence. And when I sat down to put a few notes on, very much like when I had to write the speech for my father's eulogy, I just kept seeing his face. With that face, it wasn't great for speech writing because there was an overwhelming peace comes over and also a deep sorrow in the pit of my stomach. But do it, I must. We've heard many wonderful contributions, many things of that I would have spoken about today, but my contribution will remain quite simple and quite personal. I got to know Morani after I was elected a member. During my time living on Warramunga, even though I look a very young man, it was nearly 30 years ago now, uh, Morani wasn't there. If he was interstate or, or in Darwin. <laughs> which is probably just as well, because if he was there, I quite easily could have been seen as the, the new white fellow that he was going to teach culture to, like rolling around the ground in the dirt <laughs> and pretending to be a turtle. <laughs> I fortunately missed that, and I had others take me under their wing. However, there was a deep connection that we felt together through our own family and my family with the Tiwis. We got to know each other very well and it's that connection that I'm always going to cherish. It was a great gift that he gave to me. One of those aspects that I was very much aware of was his, 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 his great friend and Maurice Rioli, who during my early time, he was at the tail end of his football and I lined up alongside him representing Tiwi Islands footy in the uh, grand final uh, um, uh, precursor. And so I used to tell people that, uh, yeah, my footy career started alongside Maurice Rioli. So, um, <laughs> it, um, but footy was very much a religion, as, as we all know, on the Tiwis. Uh, and for me, as a Hawthorne supporter and a Tapalinga supporter, um, it was unheard of me wearing Richmond colours. Uh, but yet here I am today with it on in his honour. Um, and it's the great respect that goes with that that I have for him. I do have some simple moments that remain with me from our time together. Um, I think uh, Member Johnson spoke about it where Marani would, I, I won't say often ordered an egg and bacon sandwich, but he often ordered a egg and bacon sandwich. And uh, as I walked in, he would yell out to me, get over here, Dad, half of this is for you, because I'm on a diet. <laughs> and as you probably know, I probably don't need feeding up either. But uh, I would dutifully go over and take the seat next to him. Um, and over that, uh, that sandwich, we would share uh, catch-ups, family, um, often interrupted by his flown uh, flashing from some Tiwi family at the time, ringing whether it was JR ringing looking for something, and uh, and me telling JR to go back and do this, and Morani doing the same. So it was um, uh, it was a lovely, lovely time that I will treasure, because, and I'll, I'll add to the one thing that um, um, the leader of government's business said around three things. He was he was absolutely passionate about being family, land and cultural more. 
um, he was passionate about his constituents. Um, that's why, as we've all heard, when that phone went off, there was no looking at it and putting it back in his pocket. His love of his family was never as evident in the deep sadness he felt in the passing of his dad. Or well, the sheer joy and pride that he had when he was showing me photos of Ariana on his lap, on his phone. The absolute passion that he had for his family. I loved those quiet times over the egg and bag sandwich with him. Times I will never get back. It was coming together as a family at his funeral up at Perlingimmi. Um, which was front and centre to the traditional ceremonies farewell. It was that day I personally reflected with, with deep love and respect for the man that I had as I danced for him after being painted up around his coffin that day. And I will take that with me forever. That was one day of which I wish we had many more. I look forward to the Klamath ceremony coming up where we can bid him farewell and move him. Move him. But until that day, Nempangi, Mirani, Mirani. Honourable members, the question is the condolence motion be agreed to. Those of the opinions say aye, to the contrary no. Aye. I think the ayes definitely have it. I ask the members to stand and observe one minute's silence. I thank honourable members for their contributions to the motions today. I thank all participants who have come today to, to farewell our friend and I invite you to share some morning tea or our lunch tea in our, in our hall. Thank you everybody.